Hello and welcome back to ABN's Trending Channel for the first episode of Colliding Worldviews in the Year of Our Lord 2018. We hope everyone had a Merry Christmas and a very blessed New Year. It's great to be back once again for another full new year of Colliding Worldviews. The first season was great. If you missed any shows, just go to the Trinity Channel's YouTube channel as well as my Vimeo channel, vimeo.com forward slash Tony Grillet, and be able to see the, I think it was about 34, 35 episodes that we did in 2017. And we have, of course, even more than that scheduled for 2018, as now we are starting right off at the beginning of the year, where in 2017, we started a little bit late. Um, but we're really excited to have a whole year's worth of great topics and great guests. We have the first International Apologetics Marathon of 2018 scheduled for the first week of June, and we're very excited about that. And we thank you so much for your continued prayers and support, and letting other people know about ABN's Trinity Channel and all of the great weekly shows they can find here, not only through satellite and through high-speed internet, but on many digital devices. If you have an Apple phone, uh, Android phone, Amazon Fire Stick, Roku, Chromecast Stick, IPTV, etc. The list goes on. Just go to trinitychannel.com forward slash platforms, and you can see all the different ways you can watch these shows live. And again, you can find the episodes if you happen to miss any on the Trinity Channel's YouTube channel, and also on my Vimeo channel, again, vimeo.com forward slash Tony Grulay. Now, here for the first uh, premiere, season premiere episode of Colliding Worldviews in 2018, I am blessed to have a man who is no stranger to ABN's Trinity Channel, as he and I have done a lot of shows before. We've done marathons together, and it's always great to have him join us for another topic, a very important topic that people need to know about. Today, my guest is Joe Carey. Joe has been studying Islam since 1999. He holds a master's degree in Christian apologetics from Biola University and had a special focus on Islamic studies while he was working on his master's degree. Joe is an ordained minister and he has been teaching classes on apologetics to Islam and Muslim evangelism at churches throughout the United States and abroad since 2005. He has spoken and taught on Islam both domestically at a number of churches and internationally in nations as diverse as Kenya, Brazil, and Nigeria. He is a frequent guest here on ABN's Trinity Channel, and he's also been a guest for several episodes of the God, Country, and Family radio show in San Antonio discussing issues of Islam and today's culture. He has been quoted in several articles on the American Family Association's One News Now news portal as well. He has lectured as an instructor for the Calvary Chapel Bible College at two satellite campuses. And of course, frequently, he reaches out to share the gospel with Muslims and equips and encourages other Christians to do the same. Brother Joe, it's great to have you back once again. Tony, it's great to be here. Looking forward to a good one-hour discussion today on a very vital and important topic. Yes, indeed. This is a topic that I'm sure some of our guests are familiar with. If they're familiar with Islam, they've been studying it, they've been following it, they've been looking at all the different scholars out there who write books and write articles on these topics. Today, we are talking about a letter that was put out about uh, seven years, um, I'm sorry, 10 years ago now. Uh, in 2007, a consortium of Muslim clerics and scholars produced a document entitled A Common Word Between Us and You, which was issued as an open letter to the leaders of the major Christian churches. The document was answered by another open letter from religious academics at the Yale Center for Faith and Culture. At first glance, the authors of both documents seem to be motivated by a desire to establish a dialogue between Christians and Muslims, yet is this really the case? <laughs> that is the, uh, the, the top summary of a book that I'm going to mention here in a moment, but Joe, how important is this topic of a common word or the, or the common word movement we're saying in the show? This is a dangerous and deceptive. So what, what are your initial thoughts on this common word movement? Well, my initial thoughts, Tony, uh, going all the way back to 2007, October 2007, this, this, this is a 10-year-old issue. So it's not new news um, to your audience, but it may be news to many people. Uh, one thing that I talk about as I travel around the country speaking at churches, one of the common um, messages that I'm giving today, I title Islam and the Last Days. 
And I talk about the great falling away that precedes the, the coming of the lawless one, the Antichrist. And one of the issues that we see um, relative to the great falling away in America is the, the deception that Islam is pulling over the eyes of, um, shall we say, ignorant Christians. I hate to use that word. They're just misinformed. They're ill-informed. Um, and a lot of that comes from this whole common word document and the idea that Christians and Muslims all worship the same God and, you know, can't we just hold hands and, and get around a campfire and sing kumbaya and, and hug one another and love on one another? Um, not that those are bad things. Don't get me wrong. I love reaching out to Muslims. Muslims need to be saved. Muslims need the gospel. But there's a proper way to do it. And we need to, we need as a Christian community to be aware of some of the more deceptive elements that Muslims are, are propagating upon the world and particularly upon Christianity. And this common word issue is one of those deceptive documents and deceptive issues. Now, Joe, you are, you know, I know, a lot of people out there know that there are many groups out there who demonize Islam, they demonize all Muslims. Uh, some of them are knowledgeable about Islam, but they, they demonize it, they criticize it, whatever, but there's absolutely no gospel in their message because they aren't Christians. At the same time, you have the opposite end of the dichotomy where you have uh, Christians who love all people. They don't care if they're Muslim or not. And if they are Muslim, great. They want to reach out and get the gospel to them. But at the same time, they are completely ignorant of Islam. They have no idea that it's a religio-political system. It's a religion and a political ideology combined. They don't see any threat from the uh, the system whatsoever. I mean, they don't even look to other countries that are under Sharia currently to see what life could be like for them ultimately. But uh, you have these two dichotomies, and that's why I love uh, your ministry, Joe, and uh, it's why ABN the Train Channel is so important, because we're in the middle where we say, hey, we don't sugarcoat Islam. You know, we don't agree with this watered-down, sugarcoated Walt Disney version that you get from the mainstream media and a lot of other people out there. But we also... Um, don't demonize Muslims. Uh, we have this this healthy middle where we say, hey, love Muslims, but critique Islam at the same time. This, of course, is something that Dr. J. Smith's Fander Center focuses on as well. Critique uh, critique Islam, love Muslims. And this is what I love about um, you and I and AB and the Train Channel and, and Fander Center and different Christians who you and I know who do this same thing. Now, you said this document's about 10 years old. Uh, in a nutshell, for people who are not aware of this document and some um, uh, some of the things that have happened because of it, uh, in a nutshell, what is the common word issue all about? Okay, um, in a nutshell, back in late 2007, I think it, was, it came out in October 2007, 138 Muslim scholars from across a, a very broad spectrum of Islamic belief and practice, everything from Sunni to Shia and, and many in between, and, and splinter sects off of those two major sects and so forth, 138 senior Muslim scholars came together and penned a letter that was, as it were, an extended olive branch to Christian leaders and, and all Christians worldwide to come together upon the commonly held beliefs between the two religions of love of God, and love of neighbor. Now, that sounds very Christian. You know, the, Jesus said when he was asked, what are, the, what are the greatest commandments? He said, to love your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. So this, this, this belief that we should love God and love our neighbor is a sincerely held Christian belief. And so 138 senior Muslim scholars extended this olive branch under these two um, commonly held beliefs to Christians to come together to, to essentially set aside our differences. And, and here's, here's the, the key um, point. We need to set aside our differences and come together on what we hold in common. And this, as you mentioned, this letter was responded to by Yale Divinity School and signed on to by 300 senior Christian leaders um, in the United States alone that, yes, we, we will come together with you on these commonly held beliefs, and we will agree to set aside our differences. And it is, it is totally deceptive. Many of, the, many of those initial 300 signers um, who put their name to the, the Yale uh, response, um, I think probably three or four dozen of them, have since retracted their signature once they discovered 
what the basis of this common word document was. And, and we'll get into that a little bit longer, but in, in a few minutes, but this is, this is the gist of it. It was a, a letter sent to all Christians worldwide to set aside what we hold different and come together on these two shared beliefs. Now, it's interesting, too, because unless a person is aware of the Islamic worldview and the Christian worldview, um, they aren't going to realize that it's not the similarities uh, that matter most. It's actually the differences, because it's the differences that let you know it's not the same God, it's not the same Jesus, it's not the same um, thing that Allah, the Allah of the Quran and the Yahweh of the Bible require of us. I mean, the, the, the means or method of salvation is completely different. As soon as you define your terms, you see the problem here. <laughs> now, of course, um, in this common word, it's more like, hey, like you said, kumbaya, this is what we have in common. Well, yeah, I mean, we both believe that there's a creator. I mean, this world can't exist unless there was a being who created it. But as soon as you ask who is this being or who is this God, you get completely different answers. And Joe, that's why it's so important. I, I want to point people to your ministry, RadicalTruth.net, because you write articles all the time. Again, you are, of course, a frequent guest and, and a friend who's on all these shows. But it's very, very important for people to know that it's the differences that matter. And unless you have done your homework, you need to look to people who have done their homework, like Joe and like all the other guests who we have on the Trinity channel here who have studied Islam. And again, this is the perfect group of people for it to come from because we love Muslims, but again, we critique Islam at the same time. Now, uh, in Islam, context is everything. So what is the context of the common word letter that was issued to Christian leaders and all Christians everywhere when it was sent out? Um, good question, and and yes, context is everything. One one of the issues that Christians get blamed of or blamed about from Muslims is is taking verses out of context or taking issues out of context, and we never want to be accused of doing that. Um, before I answer that, let me jump back to what you said earlier. It is important to recognize that we have differences. Let me give you a, a very quick um, anecdotal story about that. I was on a. a, a a, a university campus a few years back and got into conversation with a with a Muslim, um, which I do frequently. And and he, he asked me the question, he says, so why can't you and I, because we believe different things, why can't we just set aside our differences and come together on what, what we hold in common? So he, he was actually working off this whole common word document and, and, and the whole mindset behind the common word. And I said to him, I said, Saleh, what you're suggesting of me as a Christian is something that I cannot do. I said, one of the common differences that you're asking me to set aside between Christianity and Islam is the fact that Jesus was God in human flesh and that he died for the forgiveness of our sins. That's what defines Christianity. He died, he rose again, he was buried, and he rose again. The Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 15, uh, beginning with verse 3, identifies this as the basis of the gospel message. And I said, Salah, you're asking me to set aside this essential difference, which, which, which is what defines me as a Christian. Essentially, what you're asking me to do is to give up my Christianity for the sake of peace between Islam and Christianity, between Muslims and Christians. And I said, I cannot do that. Do you understand what you're asking me to do? And he was, he, he was kind of flabbergasted. He didn't know how to respond to that. He didn't realize what he was asking me to do. It was essentially the same thing as, as me asking him to forsake the Islamic belief that there's no God but Allah and Muhammad is his messenger. If I had asked him to do that, he, he would have had a heart attack. He would have come unglued. But, but that's what he was asking me to do as a Christian, based on this whole common word document. Now, the, the, so, context, uh, the context of this common word document comes from a verse in the Quran. It's Surah 3, verse um, 64, or Surah 3, Ayah 64, which talks about coming together in the common bonds of love of God and love of neighbor. But in context, the historical context is important here because this, the context of this in the Hadith is found in Sahih al-Bukhari, and it's in Book 52, um, Hadith number 191. And it comes from the, a letter that Muhammad wrote to the Byzantine emperor of the time, Heraclius. And let me read to you just the, the short narration from uh, Sahih al-Bukhari. It says, In the name of Allah, most gracious and most merciful, from Muhammad, the messenger of Allah, to Heraclius, emperor of the Romans, peace be upon him and 
who and he who follows guidance. After this, I extend to you the invitation to accept Islam. Embrace Islam and you will be safe. Accept Islam. God will give you double the reward. And if you turn away, you upon you it will be the sin of your subjects. Now, here's a part that's, that's quoted in the common word letter. O people of the book, come to a word that is common between us, that we should worship none other than Allah, that we should not ascribe any partner unto him, and some of us should not take their fellows as lords other than Allah. If they turn away, you say, you should say that we testify to our being Muslims. Now, here's the interesting part. Notice there's two, two very important aspects to this hadith, which forms the basis for the common word. Number one, it is an invitation to accept Islam. It is dawah, pure and simple. And that's what this letter is that was issued by 138 Muslim scholars to Christian leaders and all Christians worldwide. It was an invitation to come together and accept Islam. Come to a word that's common between us that we should worship none other than Allah and we should not ascribe any partner unto him. So what Muslims are asking Christians to do is embrace and accept the Islamic view of God, Tawheed, that God is one only in essence and that he has no partners. This is, the, this is actually quoted in the common word letter. And yet 300 senior Christian leaders agreed to that letter. It's, 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 it's interesting. Now, notice one other thing about this, um, this the basis, the, the background of this. I extend to you the invitation to accept Islam. Embrace Islam, and you will be safe. This was actually a letter of threat to the Roman Emperor Heraclius. To accept Islam, if you do so, you will be safe. If you do not, be prepared to pay the cost. And this is the, this is the example Muhammad has set throughout history. Whenever he sent his um, his warriors or his followers to a nearby tribe or a nearby group of people who were not yet Muslims, he gave them the instructions. Offer the invitation to accept Islam, to embrace that there's no God but Allah, he has no partners, and that Muhammad is his messenger. And if they accept the invitation, then their life and their property are safe from me. But if they reject the invitation, you are free, you are free to engage in whatever it takes to force them to embrace Islam. This is the basis, this is the historical context behind the common word letter, Tony. Now, what do you think would be the reaction of Muslims if it, if it was on, if it was the other way around? If Christians are the one who came up with a document asking Muslims to uh, embrace the belief that uh, God is one in one way and three in another way. God is one in essence or being, but three in person. And, you know, we want to have this uh, common understanding that there's one God, but this is actually who he is. Yes, Jesus exists, but he wasn't a Muslim. He was actually a Jew, and he died on a cross, and he rose from the dead. And uh, we want to have this common word between us. Uh, what do you think the reaction would be of Muslims throughout the world? Well, I, I, I think that that's pretty self-evident. Uh, Muslims would come unglued. Um, as as Christians should be doing regarding this this whole common word letter, but but yet they didn't. They bought into the deception. And they said, "Yeah, hey, this is a cool thing. It sounds it sounds very Christianese. Love of God. We Christians we're supposed to love God, and yes, Jesus said we're supposed to love our neighbor as ourselves. But um, I, if the if the tables were turned, oh my goodness, I I can only imagine." <laughs> So this is obviously a, a one-way document here. In other words, uh, uh, heads we win, tails you lose. But exactly, one, yep. one of the uh, one of the uh, um, resources that I do want to recommend to our viewers, and this is what I read at the beginning of the show at the very top here, and also this actually has an uh, appendix on uh, Heraclius of Byzant Byzantium, the the letter that Muhammad wrote. Uh, that Joe just read, that is an appendix in here as well, as well as some other stuff, including the original A Common Word Between Us and You Islamic document, and also the uh, feedback of an author. And this author is none other than Sam Solomon. This book is called The Common Word, The Undermining of the Church. This is what it looks like right here. Not a, uh, a very big book. It's actually a pretty quick read. Only about uh, a little over 100 pages here. But again, this will give you that, that original common word 
uh, document as well as Sam Solomon's uh, view on this. And Sam Solomon is a Christian, a former Muslim, an expert in Sharia. Uh, so all of his books are uh, or great to get. I recommend you get all of them. But yeah, this one's called The Common Word, The Undermining of the Church. Now, Joe, uh, books and documents have been written, this is one of them, uh, to help Christians understand the basis of the common word. Let's talk about some of the analyses uh, others have done to help dissect this document. Yeah, well, you mentioned the book from uh, Sam Solomon, which I have in my library as well. In fact, I have it sitting here on my desk. I was going to use it as a reference today if needed. But um, there have been several Christians that have written responses to those. Uh, Mark Dury wrote one. I remember reading one. I I think I have a copy of it online from uh, a gentleman who who has a a Muslim ministry in, uh, in the U.K., and his name escapes me right now. It'll come to me in a minute. But several several people responded to this and jumped on jumped on it uh, fairly quickly. I, I was actually one of the earliest ones when I saw this. I, I, I read the letter. Um, somebody sent me a copy of it in in October 2007, and I immediately jumped on it. And I go, "This is significant. We need to dissect this." And uh, I was in communication immediately with with several Christians around the world, several scholars. One of the scholars that I actually collaborated with, I mentioned a moment ago, is is Dr. Mark Dury, and I know he's no stranger to ABN. Um, Mark Dury sent me a copy of his initial draft, and I read through his draft, um, made some suggestions to it. He incorporated those suggestions into into his final document, as did others, and there were, it was it was a collaborative effort. But Mark wrote the uh, wrote the basis of it. He wrote the, the main body of it. Several others added things and and, and uh, d- collaborated with Mark to, to make some changes and, and kind of dress it up a little bit. But I think Mark Dury uh, and Sam Solomon both have probably the, the best Christian response and analysis to this whole common word document. And, and Mark Dury came, comes out and says, this is basically a bait and switch letter where you're asked at, at the beginning of the letter to come together on what we hold in common with Muslims, and that's love of God, love of neighbor. But at, by the end of the document, the whole thing has has come to a bait and switch where you're switched to a demand, basically, for the sake of world peace, to set aside what what separates us as Christians from Muslims and embrace Islamic monotheism. And it it it's it's ludicrous, Tony, that that so many Christians unwillingly are buying into this. And I, I want to mention some names in a little bit, maybe after the break that's coming up. I know, but but this whole common word document has become part of many Christian churches' um, interfaith initiative and Muslim outreaches, outreach initiatives, um, and it's dangerous. And this is something that all people, all Christians, and all pastors need to be aware of. Joe, we see all the time uh, throughout the United States, we don't see this in the East, uh, ironically, but here in the West, uh, where it is not as un- under Sharia, we are seeing uh, this uh, interfaith dialogue uh, type of event take place. Now, this is actually something that is listed in a book called The Methodology of Dawah, which I've talked about many times. It was published back in 1989, and it is a, a kind of a, a guide on how to make Islam palatable to the West and acceptable in the West, and it encouraged interfaith dialogues. But if you actually look at the advertisements, the posters, whenever these events take place, you'll notice that there's usually an imam uh, from a mosque, and then there's usually a liberal Jew, and then there's a, a Christian, quote unquote. <laughs> and it's not, not uncommon for that Christian to be the pastor of a Unitarian Universalist church or uh, some liberal uh, Christian, quote unquote, but it's not advertised that way. Just, hey, look, uh, Muslims, Jews, and Christians together. But you will never see any Christian who is actually knowledgeable about Islamic theology, Islamic history, Islamic expansion, the life of Muhammad, and all the other things that people need to know about. Because because they always say it's, it's not a debate. We're kind of just going to have uh, talk about the different things that we have in common, which, again, lines right up with this common word document that we're talking about. People need to be aware of this, and we have viewers who, who might be aware of it, but does your pastor know about it? Do other Christians who you know know about it? If not, you need to let them know and, and say, hey, 
we need to reach out to Muslims. We need to share the gospel with them. If Christians don't, then who will? No one will. But at the same time, we need to know what uh, Islam is according to Muhammad, not according to your modern-day Muslim neighbor, coworker, friend, etc., who loves the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. They don't define Islam. Muhammad defined it 1,400 years ago. And Joe, when you just read that um, that letter uh, a few moments ago, that was from Muhammad himself. And if people don't know what was going on in Muhammad's life and what his life was like and how uh, uh, opposite of Jesus, who loved his enemies, Muhammad killed his enemies, um, if they don't know all of this, well, then it just sounds peaceful at face value. And of course, that word peace is something we should probably define as well after we come back from the commercial break, because uh, we're definitely using the same terms with different dictionaries in, a, in many times. So uh, we do need to take a short break. We'll be back in just a few minutes with more Colliding Worldviews. Again, we are so thankful for all of our loyal viewers who tune in every single week and get these links and share them online, who pray for us, who support this work financially. If you see the videos on YouTube or anywhere else, just uh, give them a thumbs up, you know, like them, uh, leave a comment, share them with other people. Uh, there could be interaction there as well. Sometimes people ask questions on the YouTube comments that I will uh, come back and answer in a in a upcoming show. I've done this on Islam in the News, which of course is a weekly show as well. So we like to have uh, interaction in these videos. And of course, uh, we are so thankful to have people tuning in throughout the world. Please stay right where you are. We'll be back in just a few minutes for more Colliding Worldviews. As it is Avian's mission to go and make disciples of all nations, our discipleship program has spread to several different languages. Reach out to them. He wants you to break up of every division. Any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. We started out with these languages, but coming soon are even more. Stay tuned to see these programs come to ABN. Trinity Channel is now airing live 24-7 on our YouTube channel. Apologetics, debates, and discipling are now constantly streaming for all of our YouTube viewers. Be sure to comment on, like, and share our stream to support Trinity Channel's efforts to disciple all nations. Watch live on YouTube today. Now in the palm of your hand is the updated ABN SAD app, so you can now watch all the programs, shows, and channels in different languages. You can download the app in the App Store related to your device. Once downloaded, you will see six different categories within the ABN SAD app. The first category being the English category, which includes 18 different channels. The Arabic category includes 31 channels. The worship category has five channels. The discipleship category includes five channels as well. For more information, please call the numbers on your screen or visit our website at trinitychannel.com. Thank you for watching Trinity Channel and supporting ABN Sat TV ministry. You can further support this ministry through social media, Facebook and YouTube. Just search Trinity Channel and click on our page. From there, like, follow, and share our page on Facebook, and subscribe to our YouTube channel while clicking on the bell icon to the right to receive notifications on new videos that we will post to the channel each week. Most importantly, after watching a video on these sites, use the comment section to give your thoughts about the program. Continue to support this ministry by following us on social media.
Welcome back to Colliding Worldviews, found only on ABN's Attorney Channel, as far as the live show is concerned. Again, you can find the episodes on YouTube, on my Vimeo channel. Uh, be sure to like those videos, subscribe to the channels, and you'll get automatic notifications of newly posted videos each week. Again, we are now in high definition, as you can see and hear, and of course, as you can see on YouTube and Vimeo and all of that. And thank you so much again for your prayers and support. Like these videos, share them, comment, all that kind of stuff. Uh, we are on Twitter, Facebook, etc. But again, you can find it all these shows on ABN's Digital Tree and of course uh, through satellite and high-speed internet throughout the world. We're here today talking about uh, the common word movement, which again, this letter originated about 10 years ago, but there are many people who still don't know about it, the danger and deception of the common word movement. That's what we're talking about today with my guest, Joe Carey, again, the founder of Radical Truth ministry. Just find more about him and his work at RadicalTruth.net. And we're talking about this common word letter and how there's a, a, a whole lot of ignorance that still surrounds it because people are not aware of it. Now, before the break, I talked about uh, Dawa and the methodology of Dawa. And I, I, of course, I didn't confirm, uh, define that. I'm sorry. But that's something I do want to talk about now. Uh, another resource, in addition to the common word, The Undermining of the Church, again, a book by Sam Solomon, uh, there is a PDF you can find online by Dr. Mark Dury, a great scholar. It's called Notes for Christians on Understanding a Common Word Between Us and You. And when he summarizes the document, uh, number one, he says the letter presupposes that Christians and Muslims worship the same God. Number two, it has the appearance of being an exercise in dawah or Islamic proselytism. Joe, can you explain to our audience a little bit more about Dawa and what they can expect when that is actually taking place? Yeah, Dawa actually means to to issue an invitation or to invite, and it, it's the pattern that Muhammad set, as I mentioned before the break. Uh, whenever he sent out his his followers to a nearby tribe that were that were not believers or followers of Islam yet, he would tell his people to offer the invitation to accept Islam, to embrace Islam and to acknowledge that there's no God but Allah. He has no partners. He, he's he's a, a, a singular mono, a singular monad, as Dr. J. Smith calls him. He's a monad. He's, he is absolutely singular in nature. He has no partners. Um, and that, to acknowledge that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. So the, the whole process of da'wah um, is basically to offer an invitation to non-Muslims to embrace Islam, embrace Islamic monotheism, and acknowledge that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. Now, I mentioned, and, and you mentioned that, that Dr. Mark Dury um, calls this an exercise in da'wah, this, this common word letter. Here's why that's important. Here's why this is important for Christians to understand it, and even non-Muslims for that matter. Muhammad is said to be the perfect example and actually the standard of conduct and the pattern of conduct for all Muslims to follow. That's according to the Quran in Surah 33, verse 21. The Quran says, you have an example of the Prophet of Allah, a standard of a, a perfect standard of conduct to follow for anyone whose hope is in Allah in the last day. And what that means for Muslims, and what that means for us as well, and this is why we need to be concerned about that, is that in order for any Muslim to have that assurance that Allah is going to send him to paradise at the end of this life, he must pattern himself after Muhammad. He must do everything the way Muhammad did. Now, how that applies to this issue of da'wah is when we look, when we read the earliest biographies of Muhammad's life, as I mentioned earlier, when Muhammad sent his people to a, a, a non-Muslim speaking group, he would tell them, offer the invitation to Islam, and if they don't accept it, you are free to force the issue. You are free to actually compel them sometimes by means of, of military force, to embrace Islam. And that, that's what the basis of this common word document was. The basis of the letter to Heraclius that I mentioned a moment ago. Embrace Islam and you will be safe. So what does the opposite of that suggest? If you don't embrace Islam, your life and your property are, are not safe. Be prepared to fight to the battle and, and it, it either surrender, surrender your life, become a dhimmi, which is a, a, a second-class citizen that was offered to Jews, uh, Christians, Zoroastrians of Muhammad's time, and then a few other select religious groups, or become Muslim. Those, were your, those are your three choices. Embrace Islam, fight to the death, or become a, a second-class citizen. 
Why that's important today is because Christians around the world, by way of this letter by 138 Muslim scholars that is now 10 years old, have been offered the invitation or dawah to embrace Islam. If we reject that invitation, then what are Muslims worldwide, what are they obligated to do if they follow the example that Muhammad set? We are now ripe for whatever whatever the consequences are based on, the, uh, based on Muhammad's example for not embracing Islam. And that can include up to fighting for our lives to, to resist Islam being forced upon us. And what are we seeing throughout the world um, outside, of the, outside of America? I mean, we are seeing the Islamization of the United Kingdom. We're seeing a slow Islamization of Canada. They aren't nearly where the United Kingdom is. But we also look at the United States, and I've said many times before when we had uh, Tommy Robinson on, you know, America needs to look to the UK because we need to learn from their mistakes or we're going to follow in their footsteps. Of course, uh, any group out there who wants to go out and pick up the sword and fight, uh, they will be taken out by other countries, as we see with ISIS, who is down to, I believe, maybe about 2% of the territory that they once uh, had power over. Uh, they have pretty much lost. They're still out there fighting. There's actually news stories I saw today about people who are still being killed by ISIS, but they are a fraction of, the, of what they once were. Now, the thing is, is that, uh, you know, there are Muslims who say, well, look, they're doing what Muhammad said to do, so they go out and, and join them. Uh, other people say, well, no, uh, if that's Islam, well, I don't want to have anything to do with it. And we're seeing, uh, as Dr. David Cashin has called ISIS as proto-evangelists, and helping a lot of Muslims realize, look, this is Islam. If you look at those earliest biograph biographies that you mentioned, Joe, those line up more with what ISIS is doing than your average Muslim neighbor, coworker, friend, etc., in the West, who again just wants to live their life. And, and Islam to them is a a traditional practice. You know, they they might be moderates. Uh, they, of course, there are a lot of liberals, but um, they're just more conservative. They want to raise their kids. They want to live their life. But that's the thing is that Islam is more about orthopraxy than orthodoxy, and it's just more about following the five pillars and all of that. Now, what happens to the moderate Muslims who speak out? Well, there's not a lot of, of uh, good in store for them. Uh, right now is a safe time for many Muslims in the West to leave Islam because we are not living under Sharia. There is no death penalty or anything like that, although we do see these honor killings still happen here and there. But Joe, when it comes to Dawah and the common word movement that we're talking about, what examples have you seen uh, of Christian leaders using this uh, directive of the common word in an attempt to build bridges with Muslims, especially if, again, they they have this um, unbalanced view of Islam and Muslims, not separating the two, and they haven't studied Islam, and they just think that Islam is a, a peaceful religion, peace being in the Western sense of peace and, tranqui and tranquility. Uh, what, do you, what examples are you seeing from Christian leaders? Yeah, good question. This, this is one thing that I bring up as, as I travel around the country and I, and I give my message about Islam in the end times. We see many examples, and it, it's happening even today. This is why I, I think this is so relevant, it's such a relevant topic. Even though it's 10 years old, it is still fresh. It's still new to people. Um, let me just give you briefly a, a couple of examples that I have found. Um, a few years back, uh, All Saints Episcopal Church in Pasadena um, hosted the 12th Convention of the Muslim Public Affairs Council. Now, MPAC has, has been documented by the FBI as a Muslim Brotherhood front group, part of, part of the, the Hamas um, terrorist group here in America, Muslim Brotherhood front group, founded by the Muslim Student Association, which is also Hamas. Care, which is also Hamas. All Saints Episcopal Church was host for three days to the Muslim Public Affairs Council's um, convention. Now, get this. In his interview with an NBC reporter for Los Angeles, the church's rector emphasized the need for Christians to, quote, respect the teachings of Prophet Muhammad and also of the Holy Quran, unquote. When asked by another reporter about the incompatibilities between Islam and Christianity and how a Christian church could host a Muslim event, the rector responded, now listen to this, quote, our job is to come together and applaud what we hold in common. 
We hold in common a compassionate God. We are following Jesus in focusing on what we hold in common with Muslims, end quote. There's one pastor, and, 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 and I'm not picking on, on that pastor in general, or in, in particular. This is just symptomatic of what we see going on um, in several instances. That's one example. Here's another one. Uh, December 2016, St. Mary's Episcopal Church um, in Glasgow, Scotland. Now, this is outside the U.S., but this is still uh, relative to the common word, allowed the reading of Surah 19 during a Christmas service. And this is a chapter that, that has the, the, uh, the Islamic view of, of, of the birth of Jesus, that Jesus was born from a virgin. Um, the, the pastor of that church said, the belief in one God, there's a common word that we, we all worship the same God. The belief in one God unifies Jews, Christians, and Muslims. Serving God requires working for the welfare of all his creatures, creatures and the common good of humanity. Here's another one. Minneapolis chapter of the Council of American Islamic Relations um, in Minneapolis opened new offices in a section of Bethany Lutheran Church in Minneapolis, January 2017. Reverend Mike Matson, pastor of Bethany Lutheran, said the congregation has parishioners from across the political spectrum and strives to be open and willing to come to the middle where it's messy, but safely and with integrity. That, that's the whole common word mindset. Let's, let's, let's come to the middle where it's kind of messy. Let's set aside our differences and come together on what we hold in common. Um, shortly after this whole common word issue came to light, actually several, several years later, I think around 2012, um, and I know some readers might get upset at me for, for naming him, but, but Rick Warren was actually one of the signatories to the Yale response um, to this common word letter. You, you can look at the Yale response. Rick Warren's signature is still there. And there was an article that came out that, that talked about Rick Warren's King's Way um, interfaith outreach initiative holding – uh, containing many of the elements common to this common word letter. Uh, let me read you just a, a short excerpt from this article. The men, the men presented a document they co-authored. Let's talk about some of Rick Warren's staff members. A document they co-authored outlining points of agreement between Islam and Christianity. The document affirms that Christians and Muslims believe in, quote, one God and share two central commandments, love of God, and love of neighbor. And Rick Warren was actually accused, he's he since retracted this, but at the time he was accused of, of actually engaging in Islam and, and sta stating and stipulating that Muslims and Christians worship the same God, which Tony, you and I agree, and we know well that they do not. But these are just a few examples, and, and, and there are many more out there. Senior leaders, senior Christian leaders are still being deceived by the intent of this common word letter today, Tony. And we are continually seeing, again, many people in the West who are ignorant of this. And again, you know, we, we can't blame them. A lot of people don't study religion at all. They don't study Islam in particular. And many people let their, again, moderate, uh, modern-day Muslim neighbor uh, define Islam. But we need to d distinguish between Muslims living today and Muhammad himself and what the Quran and Hadith and Syria liter literature actually tell us, just as we would make a distinction between your Christian co-worker and Jesus himself and the Bible, which gives us the words of Jesus and what his life was like and all of that stuff. So we want to love our Muslim neighbors, but we again, we can't let them or we shouldn't let them define Islam. There's a, a huge difference there. Now, of course, uh, the common word, as you said, Joe, is an ongoing problem. And even if people don't jump on this bandwagon, uh, one, another bandwagon people are jumping on is, well, uh, just don't offend Muslims, don't criticize Islam, don't criticize Muhammad, don't criticize the Quran. And uh, ironically, uh, what law system uh, do those three rules or laws fall under? <laughs> it's Sharia, Islamic law, which is derived from the Quran and from the uh the Sunnah, the example of Muhammad himself, which is a mixture of the Hadith and the Sirah, or the biographical literature that we have. All of this flows from Muhammad himself. It doesn't matter what school of law a Muslim happens to follow. The Quran is the highest standard in all, in all four of the major Sunni schools. And 
you know, people need to be aware of this. If nothing else, Joe, they need to continue to look at RadicalTruth.net and the work that you put out. They need to continue to watch the shows that we do that are available on our, our websites and social media and all that stuff. Uh, in, in your opinion, what is the most deceptive aspect of the common word that Christians need to be aware of? Oh, wow. Well, I've, I've already mentioned a few of them. Um, the fact that, that this is a, an invitation to Islam, and, and you know, if, if we're to follow the example that Muhammad set, what shall we expect if, uh, if, if we reject this, this, this exercise in dawah, as Martin Dury calls it? Uh, the other, there are actually several concerning aspects. Number one, number two, that that we're being asked to acknowledge that there's no God but Allah. We're we're actually being asked to embrace um, Islamic monotheism. But I think probably the most troubling aspect is is that um, many Christian leaders are unaware of the number one, the basis behind this, the historical basis, which we talked about earlier, that they're signing on to this. And, and, and essentially, they're forsaking Christianity in doing so. They're being asked to set aside what defines us as Christians. They're being asked to basically renounce that Jesus died on the cross, that he was buried, that he rose again, that he was seen by, by um, Cephas, that he was seen by 500 others, he was seen by Paul, that he was he was seen by others that he is now in heaven that he that when he died on the cross he his blood was was sacrificed was shed for the forgiveness of our sin christian leaders who are embracing this common word letter now and there are many and they are still doing it are being asked essentially to renounce their christianity for the sake of world peace and for the sake of peaceful relations between christians and muslims and Tony, it's a travesty. I can't believe that so many people are being taken in. That's why that's why this show is so important. And, and I want to make sure your readers are aware. I should have mentioned this at the beginning of the show. Uh, there are actually two websites dedicated to this whole common word issue, acommonword.com and acommonword.org. One of, one of those two actually has the original letter that was sent out by 138 Muslim scholars, has the Yale response, has the signatories that were that were originally part of the 300 signatories to the Yale response, all, all 300 names there, including many common names. Um, that I, I could go through the list like, right now, but I won't for the sake of time. And others, many others have signed on to this letter since then, and it's still an ongoing issue. And every time a new Christian leader signs on, the common word groups applause and they go, "Yay! See, more people are coming on our bandwagon." This is why we need to get the we need to get the word out. We need to get the warning out to Christians worldwide that this is not something you want to embrace. You are forsaking Christianity if you do so. And even if people don't hear about this common word movement, they never join it or anything like that. The assertions that are made in it are still continually be, being spread. Uh, there are a lot of people out there who just don't know about Islam according to Muhammad and what his life was like and all of that stuff. And Joe, uh, to piggyback on what you were saying that Christians are um, rejecting pretty much, or at least uh, compromising on, whether they know it or not, in addition to that, it's just the personhood of Jesus himself, uh, that he's an eternal person who has always existed with the Father and the Holy Spirit, and he took on a second nature, a human flesh, Muslims don't believe that. Muslims believe that Jesus was a Muslim, which we do not have any historical evidence for if you look outside the Quran itself. It's interesting how all Roman and Jewish and secular history outside of Islam completely disagrees with it. I mean, even if you don't take the, the Quran or the Bible and read either one, if you just look at objective history, it lines up with the Judeo-Christian worldview, not the Islamic worldview. And that's one more thing that people are confused about because, Joe, as you know, it's, it's commonly said by a lot of people and it's commonly believed that Judaism, Christianity, and Islam are the three major uh, or just the three Abrahamic religions is what they call it. But even that is a problem because whereas Abraham and who he was is something that Jews and Christians would agree on, 
That is not the case with Islam. It's a completely different Abraham. Just like it's a completely different Jesus, it's a completely different Abraham. They believe that Abraham and Ishmael actually built the Kaaba, which is now that black cube that they have in Saudi Arabia. Uh, this is all totally, completely revisionist history. It is not uh, true history. It didn't actually happen. But this is the view of Muslims. And that's why I said, you know, we're using the same terms, but unless you realize we have different dictionaries, P Christians and Muslims are going to continually talk past one another. We need to define our terms from the get-go, and not in a common word sense, but in a uh, common humanity sense, <laughs> that, hey, we're both human beings, but what do we believe about who God is and how we can be reconciled to God and who Jesus is? And Joe, you never see in these interfaith dialogues that the political Islamists love to put on, there's never a debate. It's always a what do we agree on type of conversation. And again, the Christian, quote unquote, who's always featured in one of those, or the Jew, are either liberals or um, you know, not, not even true uh, Christians, I would say. Um, but also are, are ignorant of Islamic history, theology, and, and all of that stuff. Joe, we have mentioned a few different resources to our viewers. The first one I wanted to give them, again, is The Common Word, The Undermining of the Church, a book by Sam Solomon. Uh, Joe, we have both mentioned a PDF article by Dr. Mark Dury. If, you, if, if viewers want to go online— Type, this is the name of it, Notes for Christians on Understanding a Common Word Between Us and You, subtitle, Together with Reflections on the Yale Response. Again, Mark Dury, that's D-U-R-I-E. Another PDF that I have, which you can find online as well, is called A Common Word, quote-unquote, in Context, Toward the Roots of Polemics Between Christians and Muslims in Early Islam. This is by uh, Gordon Nickel. And he actually really goes into the historical sources, uh, not so much this new common word movement, but just this belief of common word in general. So those are three great resources. Uh, Joe, what other, what other things would you point people to to, to get more information about this? And please uh, restate those websites as well. Yeah, the, the, the two websites that address this are A Common Word. That's the, so it's just all run together, A-C-O-M-M-O-N-W-R-D, -O -O acommonword.com and acommonword.org. Both websites cover different aspects, but they're both tracking on, on this uh, monumental issue at, as Muslim leaders see it, because the, the, you know they got, a, they got Christians worldwide to sign on into agreement that we worship the same God when we do not. And, uh, so your reader, your, your listeners or readers can... can can, can go to those two websites. Uh, on my website, I actually have a whole issue dedicated to the common word. I have several articles on there. Mark Dury is a good one. Um, you mentioned two good resources. Uh, I, I, I would just encourage your viewers to become educated on this issue. Uh, let me just read something real quick uh, before, before we run out of time uh, in Mark Dury's analysis. Uh, he says on page 15 of the letter, let the Muslim scholars conclude, conclude with a statement, let this common ground be the basis of all future interfaith dialogue between us. What these Muslim scholars are suggesting is that interfaith dialogue can only be obtained, can only be pursued when Christians acknowledge that there's no God but Allah and Muhammad is his messenger. This is the danger. We do not worship the same God, Tony, as you and I know, as, as, as Dr. J. Smith knows, as, and as, as many of, of your guests on ABN know, we do not worship the same God. And, and if, you're, if your viewers are confused about that, I have a couple articles on my website at RadicalTruth.net that talks about the fundamental differences between the Yahweh of the Bible and the Allah of Islam. We are not worshiping the same God, yet this common word letter as Dr. Mark Dury um, suggests and, and actually says, presupposes that Christian, Christians and Muslims do worship the same God, and we do not. That's something that people need to be aware of. Yes, there can only be one God who exists. Uh, from a, a philosophical level, uh, yes, there can only be one God, and Christians and Muslims do recognize, well, there's creation, there must be a creator. But the uh, <laughs> it kind of ends there, because as soon as you ask, who is God, that's when you get completely different answers. And of course, when you ask, who is Jesus? And what does God the Father require of us in order to be reconciled to him? And what did God do 
in order so that we could be reconciled to him. Uh, God is a nature. It's, he's not a person. That's something that Muslims, of course, have wrong. God is referring to a nature just as human as a nature, just as Joe and I are different people. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are different persons. So one God, three who's, one what and three who's. Jesus is one who and two what's. So <laughs> we're not going to get real deep into to that theology here on this show because we're about out of time. But we do need to uh, uh, you know, let people know that this is something that need to be aware of. These resources that Joe and I have recommended to you, please check these out. If nothing else, get the link to this video and share it online, share it, share it on social media. Get the link and email it to people who may not be on social media because everyone needs to have this information. Again, we want to encourage you to love the Muslims around you. They're people made in the image of God. They need a savior. They need to know who God truly is and how they can be truly reconciled to him. And it's not based on their self-righteous good works. It's through repentance, turning from their sin, and putting their trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. That is something that both Joe and I have done, and we are brothers in Christ, and we are so thankful for our brothers and sisters in Christ who are throughout the world who have a heart for Muslims. At the same time, again, don't let your moderate Muslim neighbor, coworker, friend, etc., define Islam. They don't. Muhammad did 1,400 years ago. And if you have not studied Islam, please stay tuned to ABN's training channel every single week for more episodes of Colliding Worldviews, Islam in the News every single Friday, giving you the news that you will not find in the mainstream media. And Joe, thank you so much for being on. It's been a blessing to have you here and bring a lot of information about this vital topic of a common word. Glad to be here, Tony. Um, always blessed to be on ABN. Always blessed to be able to educate those who are, um, are, are ill-informed about Islam and the great deception that is pulling upon the world. So my, bless, my, my pleasure to be here. Amen. Thank you so much. And friends, we want to encourage you. Again, reach out to your Muslim neighbors. Share the gospel with them. Don't fear them. Love them enough to share the truth with them. That is the most loving thing that we can do for all people, not just Muslims, but anyone who has never repented and put their trust in Christ. We're all going to die someday. We're all going to stand before God and be judged. How important is it for us to uh, have our hope, uh, and not a blind faith type of hope, but our um, uh, assurance and our, our knowledge of the truth and assurance of the truth through the power of the Holy Spirit who indwells us when we repent and put our trust in Christ. Again, the Christ of the New Testament, not the Jesus Christ or the Jesus, just Jesus alone, of the Quran or any other man-made religion out there other than Islam itself. Uh, we can encourage you, repent, put your trust in Christ. If you've already done so, reach out to the Muslims around you, share the gospel with them, and again, share this show with people out there because they need to know about the common word movement, the dangers and deceptions that entail it, uh, all of it, and they need to know uh, a proper response and how to help educate others as well. Thank you so much for being with us, and we'll be back next Monday for another episode of Colliding Worldviews. 